the an ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. It's, it's really a pleasure to have you all join us today. And I know that, uh, that as people are logging on, uh, kind of getting, getting, getting set up and getting organized, uh, I, um, I wanna uh, just really acknowledge that we are in this incredible moment of, of transformation and, and a resurgence of resistance. Uh, and, and this is an opportunity through the, the virtual community to be able to engage with some of our lived experiences and, and to hear from some incredible, incredible women. And uh, I'm uh, so looking forward to our time. Uh, in order to get us started, I would love to pass it over to uh, beloved Rhiannon Bennett, who is the, the decolonization, decolonization consultant for Feminist Deliver. Hey, Rhiannon. Hey, Angela. Do we good to go then? I see there's still quite a few people trickling in here. And maybe while people are still pouring in, um, I can let people know that there is um, closed captioning that's available. Uh, if, you, if you need, need or require um, that, it's in the bottom there. You can click on that and get the closed captioning going. Is there a number that we want to want to wait for? Or are we just going to dive right in? Just dive right in. All right. So OCM Siayet, Ait Nasqualo and Zikwitznala, Antha Rhiannon Tlitznach Humathquiam, Itzen Shleni, Itzen Kwamkwam. Uh, my dear friends and relatives, it uh, gives me really good feelings uh, to see your names all here today uh, and to see the faces of some incredibly um, powerful change makers uh, that I'm so honored and humbled to be to be opening the floor for. Um, my name is Rhiannon Bennett. My pronouns are she, her and hers, and I am a proud um, Musqueam woman. We are, we are in this, this incredibly powerful moment in time where we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of tension, a lot of flashpoints, and, a, and a, lot of, um, a lot of opportunities. And I, I, people are, are finally sort of coming uh, to listen, to think about things, doing, doing things differently. And I think about how many years conversations like we're gonna be having today have been happening and how people weren't listening. People weren't maybe weren't ready for those conversations. People weren't willing to, uh, but now there's, there's things are shifting. Um, and it's, it's really, it's really kind of fascinating. And in particular in these, in these COVID times, as everyone has sort of slowed down. And for some people, there's been this sudden realization that the world is a grossly inequitable place. Um, but also there's been an incredible, um, the amount of accommodations that have been come so quickly. So many things that we were, many people were told, no, you can't do that. No, you can't work from home. No, you can't have that accommodation. Uh, no, we can't give you that money. No, 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 no. And sometimes in matter of that, everything has shifted and all of these accommodations have been provided for people, for privileged people for people who have never needed these accommodations until today, when people who have been in such need of these accommodations have been asking and asking and asking for them and nobody listened. And I think that, you know, thinking about how all that ties into imperialism and capitalism, how all of a sudden we can pour out billions of dollars to support the economy, yet we still can't find the funding to provide clean drinking water. So it's it's amazing how some things are get the yes and and the the funds flowing right away, and it just it goes to really show all those undercurrents of it's not for a lack of um, resources, it's not for a lack of possibility, it's simply for a lack of want that nobody has wanted to do those things, and that's why they haven't happened. And it it always always comes back to some of my core core teachings that I have from my from my family and my community is that to live um, as with one heart and one mind that not samat that one heart and one mind and if we really truly were all living on this earth with one heart and one mind what an incredible 
um, difference it would all make. And, and people like to think that, um, that so many of those things just aren't possible, that we can't have these changes, we can't have these accommodations, we just can't do it. Uh, capitalism is the only way of being, it's the only way we've ever been, it's the only way we've ever done things. Well, surprise, <laughs> uh, capitalism hasn't even been on my lands for 200 years yet. So it's, it ha it's still, you know, years away from 200 years on these lands that I'm sitting on today, yet somehow we're so invested in this way of being that we can't possibly do things a different way. And I think that, um, I think that's ridiculous. And I'm super excited uh, for these powerful voices that are going to be here today to talk about that because, you know, the first ship didn't sail into these waters here until 1791. The first European occupation and settlement wasn't until the, on, in my territory until 1827. So that's, we're not talking, you know, a very long time ago. Um, and my family has thrived on these lands for 10,000 years without policing, uh, without capitalism, without um, all of these things that suddenly nobody can think of a different way of being. Well, there's lots of lots of wisdom out there for a different way of being. Um, and I know that we're going to have some amazing conversations about that today. So just, um, yeah, just really want to set the table and open the floor for this amazing conversation uh, that's going to happen about a different different ways of being because it's it's possible. It's it's not it's it's so possible, and I know everyone's going to be fired up and inspired. Um, so just want to raise my hands and my deepest respect for everybody uh, for being here today, and just um, really want to leave on that not so much note again, just that that one heart, one mind. And there's so many things that we can accomplish. So my, my deepest gratitude for all the speakers here today and for um, Angela for bringing this all together. And I will pass it uh, back to you before I give a Zoom wave and fade away. Thank you, Rihanna. Thank you, Rihanna, so much. We are here today uh, to explore toward liberation, evolving beyond 21st century capitalism. And my name is Angela Marie McDougall. Uh, I am the co-chair of Feminist Deliver and I, I'm here in these unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam and tsleil -Waututh people. And I know that people are, are logging on right now. So hello and hello to everyone that's on Facebook Live. Thank you for joining us. I have some things to sh sort out here for all of us as we get started. Uh, we do have closed captioning today. Uh, our wonderful uh, closed caption is being done by Joanne. Hey, Joanne, thank you for, for that. And we are, um, uh, um, we're going to uh, have some time after afterwards for folks to get together if you'd like and uh, to connect. And uh, so they have the opportunity to, to, to connect with, uh, with, uh, with folks. Uh, there is a breakout room that uh, will be set up for, 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 um, for attendees uh, to, to catch up. Uh, and the, what's really remarkable is how many folks have, are here from all over the world. It's been uh, amazing to see the registration. And uh, we have uh, attendees from Colombia, the Netherlands, uh, Turkey, the Philippines, uh, throughout Europe, all throughout Turtle Island. So welcome and, and thank you. If you uh, would like to learn more about Feminist Deliver, uh, we came together on account of Women Deliver, which is an international women's conference that, came, that uh, came to Vancouver last year in 2019. And we came, to, we came together as Feminist Deliver as resistance to what we thought was a, a corporate feminist uh, entity that was uh, bringing a version of feminism and we wanted to amplify the local struggles here in Vancouver while connecting to the global struggles. Uh, and we, uh, we work from, and our analysis is grounded in a decolonial anti-oppression and intersectional feminism. And so from that point of view, we're looking at the historical underpinnings of the making of, of these nation states and of the systems and oppressions and how they, how they ground down, grind down in our lives in a number of different ways. And so our work is to, uh, uh, is to grow as a, as a, uh, within ourselves as a collaborative uh, while having radical education 
creating opportunities for, for radical education. And that is what we're going to do today. We have uh, an incredible group of women that are here to, to talk about uh, capitalism and from an intersectional frame. And I would, uh, I, uh, would like to introduce everyone please to Erica Eiffel. Hey, Erica. Uh, Erica is a, a former economist with uh, the federal government of Canada and, and, and is a columnist and has a, with the Hill Times and is also founded Not In My, Not In My Color, an intersectional business uh, um, consultancy. And among other things, Erica is also a podcaster and brings uh, her intersectional analysis to the podcast, Bad and Bitchy. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to um, welcome and acknowledge beloved Harsha Walia. Harsha is uh, organized in migrant justice and anti-capitalist uh, feminist and abolitionist and anti-imperialist movements for the past two decades. Uh, she's been involved in grassroots movements, including No One is Illegal, Defenders of the Land, and the February 14th Women's Memorial March. And she has uh, an upcoming book, which is really excited about, which is, I guess, gonna be available, I, I see, uh, in February, a Border and Rule, Global Migration, Capitalism, and the Rise of Racist Nationalism. Mm -hmm. Hey, Harsha. Mm -hmm. Dr. Pam Palmeter. What can we say, uh, just, uh, in, in, as well as coming off a podcast earlier today with uh, some incredible Indigenous women, Pam Palmeter is a Mi'kmaq citizen and member of the Owl River First Nation in Northern New Brunswick and has been a practicing lawyer for 20 years and is currently the Associate Professor and Chair of the Indigenous Governance at Ryerson University. Uh, she has four degrees, university degrees and uh, has uh, been studying volunteering and working in First Nations issues. And what's uh, amazing about Pam is that uh, she is supporting grassroots organizing and lending her analysis to indigenous struggles uh, and uh, Idle No More and Missing and Murder Indigenous Women and the issues of uh, the colonial uh, violence against indigenous women. Hey, Pam. And, uh, what a pleasure to get to see Angela Davis again. Throughout Angela Davis's activism and scholarship over many dec decades, Dr. Angela Davis has been deeply involved in movements for social justice all around the world as an educator, both at university level and larger public sphere. And in recent years, uh, and, and quite profoundly, her theme of her work has been around addressing the social problems associated with incarceration and generalized criminalization of communities that are most affected by poverty and racial discrimination. Angela Davis has written 10 books and uh, her books include Abolition Democracy and Are Prisons Obsolete? And she has written a, a gorgeous book, uh, Freedom is a Constant Struggle Ferguson, Palestine, and the Foundations of a Movement, which was published in February 2016. And, uh, and as well as being on the 10 most wanted list, uh, the FBI's 10 most wanted list, <laughs> uh, Dr. Davis has conducted extensive research on numerous issues related to race, gender, and imprisonment. Hello, Dr. Davis. So, you know, we're here today and it, it's not lost on any, us, any of us, of course, uh, in thinking that it's also the uh, time of the U.S. election. It's difficult to, uh, to ignore the U.S. election. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, and I was, I've been thinking a lot, you know, on how to prepare for today and, and, and thinking about the words of W.E.B. Du Bois. And what I've uh, so uh, appreciated about his uh, analysis, and, and if, if, if viewers aren't familiar with him, he uh, was a pan-African uh, theorist, a scholar, and a great um, uh, writer and uh, thinker. 
and had has been thinking about uh, the, the historical fragility of uh, the U.S. democracy, and in particular the uh, the ways in which the social, political, and economic stress democracy could expand as well as retract based on the color line and the endurance of racism. Then throughout the history of democracy in the United States, opportunity as well as repression went hand in hand. Dr. Davis, you know, thinking about the, 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 the US election and I mean, it, the one thing about the US election is that they, they seem to go on and on. They don't, they don't end somehow, they go on and on in terms of the, you know, the, the news cycle. And uh, what comes to mind right now in this moment of, of the, you know, the completion of this, uh, the last four years and, and as it relates to democracy? I think you're on mute. This is always the classist thing about being muted. It's the... I had just muted myself and forgot. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much, uh, Angela, for inviting me to participate in this panel. I, I really look forward to the contributions of all of the amazing women who are on, on the panel. And it's great seeing you again. I believe it was about um, three years or so ago. Uh, when I was last in Vancouver and participated in the event organized uh, by the Batik Women Support Services. Uh, so yeah, well, you know, thank you for organizing this panel on this day because I am really tired of watching the returns. <laughs> um, yeah, this election uh, has, is not even an election that can uh, determine the future trajectory of this country. It's basically an election in which, the, an unnecessary election, an election in which in order to move forward, uh, we had to uh, prevent, try to prevent the consolidation of fascism. Um, uh, and, and of course, uh, we're, we're, we're desperately hoping that we succeeded in that respect. Uh, uh, it's, it's actually very disheartening uh, to witness the extent to which the country seems to be split almost in half. Uh, uh, of course, we were all aware of the power of, uh, of, of white nationalism and racism, white supremacy, and you know, all of, all of those uh, backward ideas that uh, the current occupant of the White House has attempted to mobilize over the last uh, four years. Uh, but I don't think any of us ex expected that so many people would vote for him. Uh, it really gives us pause and we really have to think about our organizing strategies and how uh, in many ways, we've neglected uh, the rural areas of this country. Uh, we've neglected a lot of the um, white people who live in rural areas. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, having said that, uh, this is where we are. And the whole point of the election is to try to create some space uh, so that we can engage in the kind of organizing uh, that will uh, reflect uh, the uh, needs and desires of indigenous people, of, 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 of people of African descent, of Latinx populations, Muslims. Uh, um, and, and this is where we are. Uh, this is, it's, it's been a year of, uh, of contrasts and contradictions. Uh, and, and uh, on the one hand, we're very excited about the fact that over the last period, we've seen the largest demonstrations in the history of, 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 of this country against racism. And so we know now that there is a much more powerful base uh, uh, with respect to our struggles against racism. Uh, uh, but um, but there's so much work to be done. There's so much work to be done. And, it, and it's so distressing to see that 
uh, people are still not aware of the influence of colonialism and of the particular um, of, 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 of the set of issues that affect indigenous people. Those of us who work on incarceration point out that if we, if we look at the population of the prisons, we see that actually uh, indigenous people are much more likely to be incarcerated than any other group of people in, in the country. And so, you know, what can I say? Uh, this is uh, where we have to begin to accelerate our organizing and, and bring in the question of capitalism. Thank you so much for making that a, uh, one of the themes of, of, of this gathering. Mm, thank you. And we, uh, you know, we uh, I often think that Canada is, um, the United States provides a lot of cover for Canada and, and the ability for Canada to not necessarily explore the makings of the nation state and, and to the extent to which the electoral process is useful and, and what it means, all of the, 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 the realities around creating Canada. And I, you know, I know uh, Erica in, you know, in, in, uh, you know, in Ottawa, you're, uh, you're there and it, you know, how, wh how do we understand democracy in thinking about the United States and what's happened, uh, what's happening right now with their electoral process? Well, it's funny because I think Canada treats the US as the big brother it can hide behind. And much of the same uh, trends and colonialist policies that we've seen in the US were sometimes created in Canada. Uh, the past system in South Africa came from Canada. The, what, that same system used to um, dispossess the humanity of uh, Black Africans in South Africa came from Canada. And it's amazing to me how much of our history, how much of our present, how much of our um, being as a country comes from a very, very systemic and systematic socioeconomic structure that was in place at Confederation. The same people who were dispossessed at Confederation, the same people for whom John A. MacDonald had um, supported the Confederate soldiers near Montreal. I mean, this is, it's no, it's no whoops that somehow um, these same groups, if you think of the head tax, of course, the dispossession of um, indigenous people is replicating itself again in Canada and in a system and a resource based system. Resources like crack to Canada, it, it just can't get off of it. And the reason is, is that that's the basis of our economy. And so when you talk about um, Canada as a colonialist structure, it was such an important jewel in the British empire. Um, and yet in order to even succeed, Canada has used its resources and stripped the land to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, so in order to talk about the making of Canada or, or these nation states, I, I, I like to go back to the doctrine of discovery. I mean, it's, it's this uh, decree by the Pope in the late, late 1400s that uh, gave the justification for colonization and enslavement and land, the taking of land. And it is, um, uh, it's, it's a piece of the story that we don't often talk about when we're talking about colonization. Uh, and it, it, I have, we've been thinking a lot about wanting to ensure that there is a, a, more, a more broader awareness of that. And I'm wondering for you, uh, Dr. Campometer, like what, when you think about the doctrine of discovery and, and in, uh, in, in thinking about the making of Canada and the struggles uh, for uh, people all across uh, Turtle Island in redressing colonization and confronting colonization, uh, how do we get to a place of making that more, more public and more, more awareness? 
Well, I think there's a lot of focus that's on these, you know, old proclamations as if they had some kind of force in and of themselves when that, you know, doctrine of discovery was really in violation of international, commonly known international laws, even at the time. And even if it was in compliance with those kinds of international laws at the time, it didn't take into account what the laws were in the territory that it was speaking of. And it had no legal authority or power to make any pronouncements over a territory over which it wasn't sovereign and had no legal authority. So I try my hardest actually not to think about the doctrine of discovery because to, to me it's, a, it's illegitimate, it's an assertion of power and law over a territory but to, you know to us our laws have always reigned supreme and I think it's important to keep that in mind that like the doctrine of discovery many of the laws and policies that have been created in Canada and the U.S. have had to manufacture legal fictions to give themselves uh, this perceived power and authority to do the things they wanted to do. So if you come somewhere and you say, you know what, there's people living here, we can't really call it terra nullius. Oh, but wait, you know, if they're not humans, if we dehumanize these people, then there's no human beings living here. So then I can claim that as against the other ships that are floating in the sea. And so it's not that really anyone thought we weren't human beings. I think there's a very broad awareness that we were. In fact, they recognized us as sovereign nations and entered into treaties with us. You don't do that with non-human beings. Um, and so you've got this constant manufacturing of legal fictions that over time gets so complex that they start to conflict with one another. You know, we're either humans or we not. We're either sovereign and enter into treaties or we're not and those treaties aren't binding and all the land's ours. So like, which is it? And I think it's, they've made such a mess for themselves that I think we need to focus less on their illegitimate laws and focus more on the paramount laws in these territories. And that's why, you know, native people are also paying attention to this U.S. election, because keep in mind, there's sovereign nations like mine, the Mi'kmaq Nation or the Iroquois Confederacy Haudenosaunee, whose territories straddle both. And they were they were only severed by this artificial, you know, border. Um, and we have, you know, the Jay Treaty and other things that were supposed to protect our rights. But it very much impacts our peoples, you know, and and that's that's something critical to take into account and to understand that despite all of these legal fictions that they've created we're, we're still in a situation where the the conflict still remains we're, we're in a place where especially in the us in places like arizona uh the native vote has the power to have an influence over who gets elected in that state yet when the t votes are calculated on cnn they refer to you know hispanic people white people black people asian people and the something else never mind that it's native american history month or that they just elected six Native Americans to Congress, three men and three women, like the biggest in history. So there, there's a lot of, you know, legal fictions and there's a lot of erasure and they have to do that erasing in order to try to maintain the situation that they've created. And so, you know, with the doctrine of discovery, it's just another law that to my mind doesn't apply here and uh, it, it's certainly in conflict with the treaties, the Dr J Treaty, with you know uh, the Royal Proclamation, with everything that's happened. And so I think it's important that people remember, just because it was proclaimed, or just because it's a so-called law, does it make it just or legal or have any real authority? Mm -hmm. And of course, the economies were based on these fictions in terms of the land and the issue being the land. And uh, I read something uh, recently. Uh, I, I, oh, I can't remember the writer. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll remember before the end of today, where he talked about uh, the that that Canada, and I guess the United States uh, is a a front, a front for mining, and uh, on a global sense. And I know Harsha, when you're looking at borders and thinking about capital, capital and borders uh, the role of Canada in mining and, and the wealth generation for Canada in that, in that regard. Uh, what, do you, what comes to mind in thinking about the US election and, and, these th and, the, and the history that, 
that uh, Pam laid out for us. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you again for, for having us and to everyone here. Um, I think uh, as Pam laid out, you know, absolutely the doctrine of discovery is a legal fiction and the entire premise of settler colonialism is a legal fiction because it had to, it, you know, was a project really of imperialism, right? Much more than a, than a legal project. Um, and I think that's the first place uh, where we can make that connection between the local and the global, because I think oftentimes when we think about and talk about settler colonialism on these territories and in these lands, we think of it as a kind of domestic project, but really settler colonialism is a method of global imperialism. It is very much connected to the entire colonization of this planet that was happening from the 1400s up until you know the 1900s and of course continues but by that I mean the kind of formal processes. Um, and so I think it's so important to locate settler colonialism within the global kind of imperialist project and of, of empire specifically and you know British and French and others um, and that project of colonialism very much including settler colonization, enslavement, territorial expansion, indentureship, all of these processes and the ways in which the entire globe is implicated in this, right? So uh, these violences bind us together in so many different ways. Uh, and in terms of of Canada, um, as Erica laid out, you know, we're often um, we find cover, and as Angela, you said, in the United States by thinking that we are somehow better than the U.S. Right? That's like all of Canada's entire liberal image <laughs> is that we're multicultural, we are peacekeeping, we didn't have enslavement on these territories, we now have reconciliation for Indigenous people, we welcome refugees. Uh, you know, it's it's all this narrative and so much of it uh, is in contrast or we position it in contrast to the United States. But, you know, if we look at we can look at so many things, but specifically to your question around mining, 75 percent of global mining headquarters are in Canada and a vast majority of them are here in Vancouver on Coast Salish territories, of course, not with the consent of Coast Salish peoples, but, you know, based in, in the economy of Vancouver, which is so heavily based in resource extraction. Um, and absolutely, you know, this means that we're bound up in so many ways that the violences of mining and resource extraction, uh, which is such a key feature of capitalism that destroys indigenous people's lands locally and globally. Mining projects are not just happening, you know, elsewhere. They're very, you know, the tar sands is a giga project that is a massive mining infrastructure here in these lands. Uh, the Ring of Fire in Ontario, uh, and really around the world, you know, gold mining extraction in Latin America, all across Africa, all of the different extractive projects that are happening that Canada is implicated in. And then, of course, you know, to add insult to injury, when we have refugees or migrants who are fleeing the terror of mining extraction, Canada refuses to accept them. And, you know, one uh, incident and story that I recall, and you know, people who are listening maybe may remember this. There was that horrible show called Border Security that was airing in Canada, and this is like a cop show for people who don't know, like a rerun of Cops, and it glamorizes CBSA, which is Canada Border Services Agency, and it's you know embedded that kind of uh, cop drama, cop docudrama where. Uh, TV crews are embedded in law enforcement, in this case with border enforcement. Um, and most people didn't even know about the show. And I didn't know about the show until there was a raid. There was a raid on a construction site in Vancouver. People may recall this is in about 2013, 2014. Um, and in that raid, a number of undocumented people uh, were picked up by CBSA. And this raid was uh, photo was filmed by this TV drama. And that's how people came to know because as this very violent dehumanizing raid was happening, there's like a whole bunch of camera crews around this construction site. So, you know, um, myself and others, we were contacted by families of people who were detained, who were picked up during this raid. Uh, and two of the men who were picked up in this raid were two cousins. And what they told us was that they in fact were fleeing they were fleeing the violence of Barrett Gold, a Canadian mining company, and their uncle had been assassinated by paramilitaries associated with Barrett Gold. When they came to Canada and they sought advice on, you know, how can we make a refugee claim? We're fleeing for our lives. They got the very sound advice, which is that you're never going to get refugee status in Canada if you talk about Barrett Gold. This means that Canada will have to accept that Canada created these conditions. So they you know, gave the kind of tired trope of narco-trafficking 
uh, which is real, but you know, it's also a trope that speaks uh, to, you know, gang violence that, that Canadians love hearing because they feel um, absent from that or not complicit in that. And they were found to not be credible because it wasn't actually their story. They had understandably and legitimately made up a story. And that's how they became undocumented and that's how they became detained and they were eventually deported. And this is just the story of two people, right? But this very much, I think, highlights the ways in which we are, again, you know, bound up in these violences, the ways in which colonialism and imperialism and capitalist terror and extraction continue to inform our relations and the violences uh, that we live in. Um, and Canada is absolutely complicit. And mining is just, you know, one small window into the ways in which this, this violence is, is occurring. And, you know, is really, it is also happening under a liberal government. It's, it's not uh, unique to say the Harper years are a conservative government. Neoliberal terror is in fact, often gains the most, the most cover also under liberal governments, right? Because liberal governments like Justin Trudeau love economic projects. They love seeing economic projects are a way to move forward with reconciliation, for example. And they use the desperation and the, the forced impoverishment of communities to force you know, free trade agreements abroad or um, you know, community benefit agreements here on these lands. So that it is very much part of the reality of violence here on these lands. Mm, yes, Angela, indeed. can I just add to that? Because you were talking about how, you know, Canadians, it's so easy to point to the US. Oh, we don't have racism. That's all in the US. We don't have cop violence. That's in the US. We don't have black, you know, racism issues, indigenous. It's all in the US. And, you know, I'm just listening to Harsha and what everyone said. It's like, one of the things people always say is about how much worse it is in the US in terms of, you know, human rights violations and things like that compared to Canada, because, you know, Canada's global image or whatever. But I mean, if you look at the extractive industry and all of the transnational corporations and you go to any country where Canada has had an, a transnational extractive company, they are the most feared. They have the highest numbers of human rights violations. And we're not just talking about discrimination and hiring. We're talking about sexualized violence, gang rapes, killings, you know, hiring of, of security forces to start wars and villages. I mean, Canada is one of, if not the most frightening entity to be around for its transnational corporations. And what makes it worse is that they say they wash their hands of it. They say, well, we have no jurisdiction. We have no sovereignty in these countries. We can't, you know, enforce what these transnational corporations do. And you try to fight it at the UN and, and try to get some kind of treaty on transnational corporations. But Canada's got this forever. You know, we're the good guys. We hold up human rights. So, you know, and that, that doesn't excuse all the bad that the US does too. But what I'm saying is Canada is literally a nightmare to indigenous peoples around the world. And most people don't get to hear their stories. Mm. Indeed. Uh, and I, um, I'm, I'm remembering uh, with, with the killing of George Floyd uh, and uh, some comments that you made, um, uh, Dr. Davis uh, relating to, and it, it, it's linked to what Harsha and uh, Pam are saying. Uh, in that the at this moment we haven't had this kind of reckoning with the implications of colonization and enslavement of Africans, and uh, you've talked a lot about the about racial capitalism, and uh, you know and and Pam and Harsha have talked about it, you know in terms of the Canadian context. Um, how do we reckon? Uh, with the you know the these uh, these times of and of of awareness raising, uh, and 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 how we mobilize our communities to uh, to take action, further action, increasing action. Well, you know, first of all, um, their efforts to um, imagine an end to racism without addressing the relationship between racism and capitalism. And this is why, especially during this period, it's so important for us to use the term racial capitalism uh, uh, to point out that um, capitalism is um, grounded in, in, in um, um, colonization and in slavery. Uh, um, and, and that so many of the 
the issues that we are addressing today um, have to do with the failure to recognize uh, uh, the impact of these issues uh, for the last 150 years or for the last 200 years or, 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 or whatever. Um, yeah, um, those who are calling for more diversity uh, and I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm so tired of hearing the slogans diversity and inclusion because the assumption is that all one has to do is to bring those who were previously excluded um, into the frame without changing uh, the, 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 the structure, the system, the frame at all. Uh, and I, 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 I was thinking that, um, um, Erica, you referred to South Africa uh, uh, and, and uh, of course, uh, uh, Pamela and Harsha, you were you know, talking about uh, um, mining issues and you know, South Africa is one of the major mining forces uh, today. And you know, one might think it's contradictory, but people who were involved in the anti-apartheid movement are now um, major capitalists who are, are responsible for evicting indigenous people from their lands and in, in Colombia and other parts of, of the world. Um, we have to think about class. Uh, we can't assume that it's possible to address racial well, racism without addressing racial capitalism. And we can't address racial capitalism without uh, acknowledging uh, uh, class. And of course, uh, gender as well, uh, because race is class, class is race. We all know that, don't we? I mean, I mean that's the framework uh, with, we use to try to address the complex ways in which these systems of oppression uh, 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 combine, um, but it seems to me that uh, particularly during this period when there is a, at least here um, um, in this part of the world, um, the uh, effort to address the historical impact of, of white supremacy uh, colonialism and white supremacy, slavery, is, is just beginning, uh, something that should have happened centuries ago, at least since the uh, putative abolition of slavery. Uh, and an and effective uh, um, uh, engagement with these issues has to involve capitalism. And we're talking about uh, um, immigrants and, and undocumented, and I mean, what, what does that mean? Uh, undocumented immigrants, uh, you know, since when did citizenship require documentation? Uh, it seems to me that if we're talking about democracy, which is what everyone is referring to in relation to the current elections uh, here, um, then we really ought to be uh, talking about how to create community and, and to recognize those who, who most contribute to that uh, community. And there are people who have no papers, who are far better citizens than anyone who can claim that they uh, are documented uh, citizens of the US or of Canada. Uh, and, and so I think, yeah, this is a period in which we have to become um, a little bit more radical. And we have to acknowledge the elephant in the room. And we have to point to capitalism, global capitalism, and the extent to which global capitalism uh, combined with the histories of colonialism and slavery is so responsible for uh, migrations that are happening all over, all over the planet, not just in North America, uh, but even in places like South Africa. Uh, uh, and of course, from from Africa and the Middle East uh, to Europe. Uh, and uh, I'll say one final thing here. It means that we, our imagination has to become a little more radical as well. I think we have to acknowledge that nation, the nation state is a product of capitalism. It's a product of bourgeois democracy. Uh, 
And, and, it, 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 and if we've learned anything, um, you, know, you know, I've read a lot of Marx and if I've learned anything from Marx, one of the, it, it's that nothing ever remains the same. Nothing is ever permanent. Uh, and that there will come a time when we will not uh, define our human communities in terms of these uh, repressive uh, nation states that, that are building uh, higher and higher walls and borders uh, to keep out those whom they have historically subject to the worst forms of repression. Mm. Indeed, and, and the... Um you know, the, the, the land and the issue being the land and, and the ways in which the economies are based on the land, uh, the uh, extract, extraction for sure, but also uh, property. And I know, uh, Erica, the idea of private property and the, uh, the ways in which Canada and certainly the United States and around the world, you know, even, even prior to colonization, uh, the idea of property and the own property land ownership in terms of wealth generation uh, has been the bedrock of uh, the economic systems for centuries uh, in terms of the colonial sense and, and, and is uh, alive certainly in, in contemporary times. Would, yeah. would you... Go ahead. No, you go. Well, I, I, I'm just listening here and I'm thinking about that connection um, between race, class and gender, which is the sort of intersections that have made our societies and have kept people in check in our societies. Um, I, I find that we cannot talk about class without talking about labor and how labor has been, uh, how our, like uh, Dr. Davis said, our, our nation state was founded on capital and capitalism, it's also founded on exploitative labor. And the idea of property and people of property is uh, something we've never quite shaken. And if you think about, oh, we're still fighting the bourgeoisie versus the pro proletariat, um, even as, you know, when you think of immigration policy, immigration policy is based on this economic um, attrition model where, uh, where immigrants are only brought in to, or the best of the best of other countries are brought in to feed um, the exploitative labor uh, model that we seem to continue to create. I also find that Canada will dispossess um, indigenous people of their land to exploit, um, to take resources in order to sell and then we'll sell it back to us as um, economic growth and it's okay because we're distributing it as health policy or as, or as some sort of welfare policy or social welfare scheme. And um, when it comes to uh, how property works, walk, but works, property is capital, right? And so often uh, when I was in, in doing in school, learning about economics, the trade-off between capital and labor was always related, right? Labor did not exist in a human form. It existed as part of the production function to produce more for economic growth. That was the humanity of people was, is commoditized all the time and needs to be to be productive. And that is the single most, that is the single problem in terms of how it's affecting us as humans and how we needed this, this sort of rabid individualism to convince people that this was their purpose in life, it was to feed this productive capacity of the nation state. And I, 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 and the reward for it is that we somehow get to be citizens of a country. If you think of, you know, you know, citizenship and property tax are very much interrelated. 
And if you really think about, you know, the rights we do have, the rights of property owners are still elevated above the rights of labor. And so that goes into the whole bourgeoisie versus the proletariat struggle that we still have. The struggle is just more sophisticated now. And, and you know, it's taken on um, sort of like a global gains and losses framework where we take all the best labor from struggling countries to feed our productive capacity in a very exploitative way. And then we sell those, pro those products back to those countries in order as a di foreign direct investment, right? In order for them to take part of the, in the global community. If you look at the IMF, for example, or the World Bank. So like, it's all this cycle of exploitative capacity that the so-called Western countries um, use to exploit non-Western countries and then prevent them from being engaged in the global community economically through big super instant institutions like the World Bank and the IMF. Mm. That um, I know that was a lot. <laughs> no, no, this is uh, this is the the looking at the economies and in, in in is is vital for us, and I I am thinking Pam about the the you know the the issue about the land and uh, the struggles right now that are happening in Mi'kma'ki territory uh, uh, with respect to treaties and the uh, to the extent to which the Canadian state acknowledges treaties. Uh, that, that Canada made. You mentioned them earlier. Uh, and of course, we, we saw, we see that here uh, in the Wet'suwet'en territory uh, and north of here uh, in other parts of, uh, of Canada. And um, how are you connecting those dots uh, with the economies and treaties and, and Canada? Well, I mean, it, it's all related because because just think that, you know, capitalism and all and the economic systems that have been created could not possibly exist without land theft and slave labor and the genocide of indigenous peoples, the people who actually occupy the territory. So it's just not possible. You have to engage in these grave human rights violations and theft of lands and resources, and then ultimately the destruction of the lands and resources in order to have this capitalist scenario, which of course is very white dominant and punitive of, of racial people. And it's about capitalism is like in simple forms is about exploitation and that the things that are exploited, people and goods and lands and resources are expendable. So the people are exploitable in multiple ways. You know, you think of indigenous women and girls, they're exploitable, they're exploited sexually by police officers, by people at man camps, by like all the, the entire system, as are their lands, as are their resources. And so when you look at tree and trees is no shield against that. It was supposed to be, because if you look at the Mi'kmaq treaties, nothing was given up. There was no surrendering of lands. There was no surrendering of resources, none of it. And if you look at all of the minutes, it says, no, you're, you're actually not gonna step an inch over that territory. You know, this is mi'kmaq So, you know, years after signing those Mi'kmaq treaties, guess what happens? Well, we're still there. We still haven't given up our lands. So they enact scalping bounties to try to wipe out our people. So. You see, in order to assert control and power over all of these territories and resources and, and labor, you have to you, you have to engage in these grave acts of, of genocide and violence. And and look at how hard these non-native fishermen are fighting. I mean, there's in the media not even apologizing. They're admitting to the violence. They're saying they will never recognize the treaties, that the fish are theirs and the land is theirs. Imagine, I mean, imagine that fiction is so deeply ingrained within Canadian society that it's worth burning down Mi'kmaq people for it. R rather than share a tiny fraction in recognition of treaty rights, which would still be wrong, 
they would rather burn down everything that's Mi'kmaq. They would rather uh, threaten them with violence um, and, and literally commit these acts while police officers are standing there watching. Mm -hmm. So treaties are no protection. Aboriginal rights are no protection in the sense that if they're always considered in the context of Canadian laws and judicial systems, which will always uphold Canadian sovereignty, the Canadian economy, I mean, you know, very quickly, the very first test case, the Sparrow case from BC on Aboriginal fishing rights under Section 35 of the Constitution, you know, it made this pronouncement saying because Aboriginal rights are constitutionally protected, it is the number one priority over every other interest. And that means after conservation, if there's only one fish that can be fished for and native people need one fish, nobody else gets anything else. That was huge. I mean, that just ran counter to everything in Canada's economic system. But then when it comes to the Delgamuk case from BC, and we're talking about land, and that would include all of the resources on land and decision making about land, all of a sudden, well, you know, you can justify Aboriginal rights for the following reasons, settlement, hydroelectric, mining, you know, like basically everything that they want to keep doing can be a justification. So while, while we would like to think that those are shields, they're not very effective. I think it's far stronger to talk about, you know, our nationhood, peoplehood, sovereignty, governance of the territory and protection of the territory and our inherent, you know, jurisdiction over the territory than it is about anything that relates to Canada's capital system or the laws that support that system. Because you can't win in that system. Like mm. we will never win in that system. And that's, uh... sorry, can I just add about Clearwater? and how Clearwater has been conveniently left out of this discussion and how they're the ones who are threatening the conservation. I mean, even DFO had to, had to, um, to board their, 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 their ships and, um, and admonish them for their, uh, for their lack of, of actual conservation and how they've actually um, broken the law. I mean, it's just interesting to me that that Clearwater, which is the largest, I believe, lobster fishery mm -hmm. in North America, has been kept out of this discussion and have wiped their hands of it, even though they have a monopoly on those fishing rights, by the mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. And, and no fishing season. They, they regulate Thank themselves. You. So the big, you know, issue in the media was, oh, but conservation and there has to be a, you know, a season for the lobster. And that's why these non-native fishermen are justified in burning down Mi'kmaq, you know, uh, equipment. Hello, clear water has no season and it has exclusive jurisdiction over its territory and it self-regulates and it consistently breaks the law. What? So where's the season argument there? You know, mm -hmm. like it's just anything that supports this kind of capitalist economic extractive structure, as long as white people are doing it, as long as the whole system are doing it and these giant corporations are doing it, it's okay. But if Mi'kmaq want to feed their families, they will burn you out of town first. And that's the, the part around what gets criminalized and uh, it ties into the role of policing and uh, how police uh, which laws are enforced and which laws aren't. And uh, and then I know at the top, Angela Davis, you talked about the numbers of incarcerated people. And uh, so thinking about the, the relationship to what Dr. Pometer is talking about in the violation of treaties, the criminalization of, uh, of Indigenous people for, uh, for asserting their sovereign uh, rights and the, uh, the role of police to not enforce the treaties, rather to enforce um, well, in this case, Canadian, uh, a version of Canadian law, uh, while letting uh, a corporation go free. We see that all over, uh, and that is in part why we see disproportionate representation of Indigenous and Black people incarcerated. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's so important to understand the um, the crisis of mass incarceration uh, 
and policing within the framework uh, that uh, has been, that you've uh, given us for this conversation uh, this afternoon. Uh, because of course, uh, policing has always been about racist repression. Uh, its roots go back to indigenous people and to slaves. And the consolidation of uh, police forces as we know now, which occurred in the aftermath of slavery was very much uh, linked to those efforts to uh, keep uh, indigenous people and enslaved people and formerly enslaved people under uh, control. Uh, um, when we um, when we think about um, the way in which such enormous numbers of people came to uh, be imprisoned in the U.S. and you know everybody now now knows that the U.S. has the largest number of people um, behind bars, uh, including the largest number of women. Some one third of all of the women who are in prison on the planet are in US uh, jails and prisons. Uh, and it's also important to uh, uh, keep in mind that the prison industrial complex, uh, which is a concept that was developed precisely in order to encourage a capacious analysis uh, of, of uh, the part played by capitalism and, 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 and racism and um, anti-immigrant uh, repression. Uh, the prison industrial complex includes, of course, immigrant detention of facilities. And as a matter of fact, when one looks at the private prison industry, the most profitable area of the private prison industry consists of immigrant detention. Uh, uh, so I, I think that um, whenever we talk about racism and, 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 and um, incarceration, we need to keep that broader um, capitalist framework in mind, that broader global capitalist uh, framework in mind, and, and recognize uh, that um, policing um, is very much a part of the prison industrial complex. And as a matter of fact, when we first began talking about um, um, developing campaigns to abolish the prison industrial complex, well, uh, policing was included, structures of policing were included. Uh, and now, of course, uh, uh, in the aftermath of the, um, the uh, racist uh, lynching, state lynching of uh, George Floyd and the killings of others, Breonna Taylor, and you know, I, I can't even, I, I would spend the rest of the hour naming uh, the names of people who have been killed over the over the last uh, period, um, as we as we 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 recognize uh, the extent to which um, uh, policing is designed to maintain the system of racism, the system of racist capitalism, um, it um, it becomes clear that we can't. There are no easy solutions. Uh, uh, um, we argue so much against reform, which sometimes disturbs people because, you know, they say, well, don't you want to reform these bad institutions? Don't you want them to become better? And then we have to point out that the history of these institutions, uh, both of, of institutions of punishment and of institutions of policing, um, that their histories are also histories of efforts to reform them. Uh, and the reforms have often served as the glue that has rendered them more permanent, uh, precisely as a consequence of the call for reforms and the institution of reforms, they have uh, uh, become uh, not only um, more um, repressive, uh, but also more permanent. And this is the, this, this is the, um, the logic of abolition. Uh, it's not so much a, a, only about the need to get rid of the institutions, although it is about that as well. It's about creating the space to imagine different ways of addressing with the, 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 the uh, questions that policing and incarceration 
um, addressed through criminalization and repression. Uh, and so this is, this is actually a really exciting moment. I should say that I've said this many times during this period as someone who has been one of the many advocates of abolition uh, for the last, I don't know, uh, 50 years, it never occurred to me that I would actually experience a moment when we would be having um, serious conversations that acknowledged by the mainstream. Uh, uh, and uh, so it's, 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 it's really exciting to see that the activism that people engage in, even without uh, acknowledgement, that it matters, that it can bear fruit, even though it may sometimes take decades. Uh, but this is one of those moments in which uh, we recognize how important the work of activists and um, um, progressive intellectuals and educators and advocates has been over the last period. Yes, and uh, Harsha, I know you've been organizing around abolition for uh, a while here in the in these, uh, and we've had lots of conversations uh, about that. And um, uh, and you've seen, I mean, we've had discussions about just local efforts to try and reform policing. Uh, by oh, I'll say I was I've been a part of that, and uh, particularly around gender violence and trying to address gender-based violence and and you know and then thinking about the ways in which police may or may not be a, a resource, may or may not be a uh, um, part of a part of a woman's safety plan, and so we've had uh, those discussions and uh, and of course you talked about the you know earlier on about uh, border security and I, and I know you connect those dots. What 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 are you thinking right now? As you know, as Dr. Davis has said, like that abolition is a uh, is uh, it's become quite a conversation of for all of us uh, within the mainstream. Yeah, thank you. Um, and well, what an honor to follow Dr. Davis in a conversation on abolition. Um, I think uh, a few things, particularly in, in our context, but really uh, thinking globally, you know, as, as Ruth Winslow Gilmore and Dr. Angela Davis have, you know, reminded us time and time again, when we're talking about and thinking about and enacting abolition, it's about really transforming the entire social conditions in which we live. Um, and for me, I'd say, you know, just to, to point out that for me, a lot of that comes also from, from working with folks who are incarcerated in various ways. And particularly, I want to name the, the early writings that I was um, exposed to with George Jackson and the Soledad brothers and uh, Safia Bukhari and others. Um, who really, you know, for me made that a reality, right? The reality of particularly political prisoners uh, who have organized for abolition for so long. Um, and when we're thinking about those social conditions, and I'll, I'll turn to gendered violence in a moment, um, but really want to, you know, such a fundamental part of those social conditions are informed by racial capitalism. Just, you know, returning to that conversation briefly, which is that in order to engage and in a rigorous conversation and a practice of abolition, that has to include the abolition of racial capitalism because that is the social condition that informs the possibility of all carceral regimes, whether we're talking about police or prisons or borders um, or the military and just the growing and expansive um, forms of uh, incarceration and incarceration and carcerality uh, that I think we also have to start to think about and worry about, which is uh, you know the healthcare system and social workers, you know child apprehension and the vast number of youth who are in so-called youth care services, um, that is a form of, of uh, that is a carceral regime, right? That is child apprehension and kidnapping that follows in the footsteps of residential schools and enslavement. And that is true also of psychiatric detention. So um, I offer that as a kind of side caution because one of the things that we're increasingly seeing in the kind of defund movement is this call to defund police and shift to community resources, which is vital. Um, but I think it also requires some specificity that those community resources don't reproduce other forms of repression or violence uh, or forms of detention. Um, and you know, so thinking just thinking briefly about the ways in which uh, abolition is so deeply connected to racial capitalism uh, and hearing everyone speak earlier, you know, I just kept thinking about Stuart Hall and his incredible quote, uh, you know, where race is the modality in which class is lived, right? It's so succinct and reminds us that there is no capitalism that is not racial and also reminds us that there is no anti-racist struggle that is not also anti-capitalist because then we fall into the kind of, 
diversity pitfalls that Dr. Davis highlighted, which especially in the context of reform, we see all the time, right? What if we just hire more people of color as cops? What if we have cultural diversity training? Uh, you know, what if we have cultural safety oh, or what if we have more women cops, you know, to deal with gender based violence? That is specifically the danger of reform. And it's also the danger of representational politics that is devoid of the material structures that is absent in analysis of the material structures that upend violence. Right. So that's why um, I think holding um, and thinking about abolition within the context of racial capitalism from which it emerges is is so necessary because it's not about just thinking about um you know diversity kind of politics and you know in the same way that uh when we're talking about race or gender or sexuality these are not only about privileges right racism and white supremacy is not only about privilege and cheryl harris reminds us of that where she actually so clearly and for so long has highlighted that whiteness is a form of property whiteness is a form of property and that's exactly what prisons and police and borders and all these carceral regimes are intended to do to protect whiteness as property. Um, and that is, you know, land being turned into property and people being turned into property and people being turned into so-called surplus populations. Um, and that's where, um, you know, work around, for me, gendered violence is so critical um, and has been so informative and of course draws on the work of Insight Women of Color Against Violence and Critical Resistance and so many other abolitionist feminists um, really all around the world who have for so long made clear that criminalization has been such a tool of gendered violence, right? So it's not only that criminalization impacts women and trans folks and two-spirit people and queer folks, but also that specifically criminalization is a tool of gendered violence in that it is intended to target, it is intended to target gender. Um, and you know we really can see colonization uh, on these lands as such a as such a primary way in which that was enacted, and also enslavement, right? So the ways in which criminalization, colonization, and enslavement specifically targeted Indigenous and Black women, specifically reinforced the gender binary, harmed trans and two spirit people, um, and that is really I think the starting point uh, for abolitionist feminism. And, and then also seeing the very day to day realities that the cops don't do anything when it comes to gender based violence as someone who's worked in the anti violence sector for decades, both in this city and in, in Montreal and Guinea and Gahaga territories. That was the reality right you get you work with folks who are fleeing violence who are facing intimate partner violence and saying that they called 911 and waited for the cops to respond either the cops don't come or people are countercharged, countercharged with assault. Um, and there just really is, you know, or have no say about how charges are laid or dropped, just the, the very bureaucracy enacts violence, right? And we know that in all the statistics um, about how prisons and, the, and police actually don't care uh, about gender violence. And of course we have a, a crisis, you know, an ongoing crisis, a genocidal crisis of gender violence, again, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and trans and two-spirit people, which points to the very fact that this is a form of violence that the state has never taken seriously and never intends to. That's not a coincidence, right? That is a consequence of settler colonialism as a form of carcerality. And so I think it is so important um, to move away from carceral feminism and also to locate carceral feminism as a form of feminism that has long harmed many women. And right, carceral feminism is just one form. We also have imperial feminism, which is very similar. Uh, you know, in the in the aftermath of 9-11, for example, we saw uh, you know, just so so much outrage amongst the white dominant feminist movement who declared that the occupation of Afghanistan was somehow a feminist mission to liberate Afghan women. Um, you know, we also have, you know, in, in every, like in many places, but particularly heightened in Quebec, this heightened kind of, you know, secularist feminism that has justified the ban on niqabs and hijabs. And this is really heightened, of course, in Europe, uh, you know, where there's a civilizing mission of Islamophobic feminism. Uh, to really kind of quote unquote save Muslim women, right? And the idea that um, saving Muslim women from the hijab and the niqab is a feminist mission. 
Um, we also have trans exclusionary feminism who have who are you know transphobic and blatantly uh, obscene in their oppression uh, and upholding of the gender binary. And so I think you know for me the kind of carceral feminism that actually enacts harm that refuses to see the realities of gendered violence um, is within a trajectory of uh, of many forms of harmful feminisms um, that have that go against the spirit of liberation that go against the spirit of freedom that go against the spirit of autonomy um, which is you know what feminism is fundamentally about it's about freedom and autonomy and self-determination um, and they go against that, that spirit by calling for increased criminalization, by calling for savior missions, by calling for reinforcing a heteropatriarchal binary, by calling for the exploitation uh, of women. And that's why, um, absolutely, I think the kinds of police reforms that have particularly been buttressed uh, by the feminist movement have been the most dangerous because they also have the most, um, they have the most power, they have the most currency because the framework of victims' rights and women's rights, particularly white women um, white and white middle-class women um, as in need of protection and you know, as daughters of the empire and mothers of the white race, that has a long history. That has a long history uh, in terms of um, white supremacy and specifically anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism. And so I think it is absolutely an incredible time um, particularly because of, as you know, both Dr. Davis has talked about and as Angela, you've mentioned the many, you know, the very troubled histories in our local work, uh, anti-violence work where so much work um, has upheld the police and prisons that it's really incredible to see those shifts start to happen um, and to refuse um, to, to refuse the legitimacy of police and prisons through our work uh, in the anti-violence sector. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I, um... Uh, Dr. Palmeter, I, I, I read uh, something recently where you uh, talked about incarceration as genocide, incarceration of ind Indigenous people as genocide. Well, think about it. Canada has been found guilty of genocide in terms of law and fact by the National Inquiry into Murder to Missing Indigenous Women and Girls, a form of gendered colonization, in fact, that although all Indigenous peoples have suffered genocide, Canada very specifically targeted Indigenous women and girls in very specific ways for sexualized violence, for sterilization, stealing of their children, you know, so on and so forth, excluding them from the Indian Act. Um, but <clears throat> when you think about, you know, everything that they've done, every, you know, there's just so many multiple layers of of Canada's culpability in what it's doing and and that it knows it and you know like a point I wanted to make was you know that this whole white supremacist system which is you know racist and sexist and classist um it, it will kill to protect itself and um it will do anything so at all costs you know, we will exploit resources for money at all costs. It doesn't matter about tailings ponds. It doesn't matter if all the wildlife dies. And think about prison. So prison is, to me, a form of genocide because what was genocide? It was this, you know, and continues to be this grave violation of human rights um, that unraveled in a multitude of ways. Uh, this underlying which is still here today so the foundation of indian policy in canada is to acquire our lands and resources and reduce financial obligations that we have to native people how do you do that well it used to be very directly and purposefully elimination scalping bounties for sterilizations you know those kinds of things it happens now in other ways murder to missing indigenous women and girls and you know um uh the shootings by police officers but also the deaths in police custody the deaths in prisons and and think about it how is the mo what's the the primary method that they've used to clear the lands of the indians it's been the institutionalization of native people so was it, when it wasn't blatant killing native people it's the institutionalization so you know, uh, forced sterilizations, forced abortions, and then stealing kids 
and putting them into residential schools. And then when residential schools, it's stealing kids and putting them into white families. And then it goes from foster care naturally to youth corrections, another form of institutionalization. And then from youth corrections, you know, statistically, you're probably going to end up in adult correction or a halfway house or a mental institution or a, a, one of the many ways in which Canada finds to incarcerate native people. I mean, literally reserves were created as a place to incarcerate them. They weren't even allowed to leave and it was against Canada's own laws. I mean, there wasn't even a law that said they could do that. They just did it. So, you know, prisons are that. Who, who is imprisoned? We are being criminalized for our poverty, for the ways in which we navigate the poverty that's enforced upon us because of ongoing genocide. So we get punished for trying to navigate the minefield of how do we survive in this system where if I'm not shot by the cops, if I'm not, you know, uh, put into foster care, if I'm not exploited by human traffickers, if I, like all of these things, you will be criminalized for it. And then if you even think about defending your lands or advocating for your rights, you're now on the terror watch list. You're now not just a criminal and an annoyance, you are a threat to national security. And so they have created this national mythology that we as Indigenous peoples are inherently criminal. And why? It's not because they don't like our culture or our songs and dances. It's because we stand in the way of lands and resources unfettered. It's because we exist and they won't be happy until we either all don't exist or we're all incarcerated somewhere. And if you look at the incarceration rates here in Canada, it's going that way. What the highest youth corrections statistics in Saskatchewan, 98% of kids in youth corrections in Saskatchewan are Indigenous girls. What do you do once you reach 100%? You just build another prison and then another? And of course, the same trajectory is going up. And so we know it's happening and it's getting, getting, and it's getting worse and worse. But Canada presents this mythology to society that things are getting better. We have reconciliation. There's no relationship more important than the ones with Indigenous peoples. Um, but they fail to say, but we're incarcerating at astronomical rates. Foster care is going up and up and up. Youth corrections is increasing. Murder to missing is increasing. Our lifespans are going down, all of that. So to me, yes, prison is part of this genocidal cycle of removing us from our lands and because they also know it's a magical formula. Once you're in prison, you can be pretty much guaranteed your kids have a high statistical rate of ending up in prison someday. And, and you just condemn people because it doesn't matter what your crime is. You could have sold a chocolate bar or a winter coat, but any prison sentence is a life sentence because now you're an ex-con and how do you get a job and how do you work in your community and how do you volunteer? You can't. It's effectively a life sentence in Canada's created economic system. So it's, I know I went on a bit on a bit of a rant there, but all, the, the whole incarceration thing, and we know that you know police officers are this feeder group for that. You know, if they need a bigger budget next year, they need to manufacture crime rates. When they know crime rates are going down, what will they do? They will racially profile black and native people and create a whole bunch of charges. And now you've got, oh, this ballooning crime rate, you need to fund us more. So it's this whole system that feeds itself and they feed it with it, black and indigenous peoples. Thank you for uh, that uh, poignant and powerful uh, 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 detailing de de um, about, about that. It matters very much. And I want to say that one of the things that you talked about the, in terms of the police and, uh, the, and the budgets, it's something that we're dealing with right now in Vancouver. We just looked at the Vancouver Police Department budget and, uh, and how they've padded it based on some things that are happening here locally. And it's, uh, it's, it's becoming, one of the things that's very interesting is that it's not, it's, it's becoming increasingly obvious for more and more folks. Uh, and certainly when people looked at this budget, the Vancouver Police Department, it was, it seemed fairly clear. Gail, uh, Erica, you want to say uh, something? I just wanted to add that um, 
I, I, I think about incarceration as a way of housing excess labor too. So for example, you know, if you hmm. are, um, if you're protesting for your land, that means you're not at work and you're not feeding that economic system, right? If you are, um, it's somehow a way of kind of hoovering up all these unemployed um, black and indigenous people, uh, poor white people, et cetera, in order to put them somewhere where they can be watched and, and conditioned and housed by the state. Um, so because they're not otherwise subjecting their bodies or their minds or whatever to that productive capacity of the state. So you've, uh, thank you, Erica, you've, uh, you've detailed that analysis as well, Dr. Davis, in, uh, in looking at the, the way of incarceration and, and what Erica just mentioned in terms of labor uh, and racialized. Um, I think you're on uh, mute. Um, yeah, and I, I think it's so important to uh, keep in mind that the reason why so many people are in prison around the world and increasing numbers of people uh, is precisely because of the um, neoliberal you know, policies and, 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 and the disestablishment of institutions that were designed to address human needs. Uh, so at, 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 at this point, um, um, virtually everything has been privatized, uh, you know, whereas it used to be the case, even in a place like the US, that you could get treated in any hospital. Uh, now, of course, the very first thing you ask is how you're going to pay for it. Uh, and so with this sort of thoroughgoing uh, commodification of, of, of human services that ought to be available to everyone, um, the um, processes of criminalization and incarceration uh, um, kick in. And we can't really effectively fight mass incarceration without uh, standing up against neoliberalism and global capitalism. Mm -hmm. Angela, may I add one quick thing? Of course. Just, um, listening to Erica and Dr. Davis, uh, is something that I've been really aware of in um, our context, which is, you know, when we talk about policing and criminalization and incarceration, specifically in Vancouver, uh, but really across Canada, we rarely talk about the ways in which neoliberalism has increased the rates of incarceration. And specifically, you know, right now we're in the middle of an opioid crisis. And we talk about it as an opioid crisis, as we should, which is to shift it from a criminal justice to a health justice framework. Um, but we don't actually talk about it in the context of the war on drugs, which is very much what the opioid crisis is located in. It's located within the context of the war on drugs that has wreaked havoc south of the border, as we know, with you know Nixon era and Reagan era policies, and you know the war on drugs it's itself um, a manifestation. Uh, of neoliberalism and racial capitalism, or in you know places like the Philippines, where Duterte has put millions of people on hit lists uh, as part of his war on drugs. Um, but I think that's you know one of the ways in which we also sanitize issues in Canada is to is to place it in a public health context, which is necessary, but then also remove it from this broader context of racial capitalism and specifically neoliberalism, right? Which is that neoliberalism is devastating. These, this country and in particularly indigenous peoples for whom uh, impoverishment is very much as you know as Pam pointed out <laughs> hi uh, is very much a, a crisis of, of ongoing genocide but I do think that's uh, something that in the context of incarceration and the opioid crisis uh, we need to all be thinking about more is not simply thinking about it as a public health crisis but also within the context of neoliberalism and neoliberal impoverishment. Um, that's happening across these lands. And of course, as we know, impoverishment is, is uh, it's not a coincidence, right? It's very much a, a consequence of global wealth. They do not, global poverty does not exist without global wealth and obscene amounts of wealth. And that is something we're seeing here as well. 
Um, and, you know, we tend to we tend to not talk about it as much because we like to think of ourselves as a social democracy. But, you know, that's austerity and neoliberalism is very much on the rise and, you know, coincides with that incarceration and criminalization here. So thank you. And, you know, on cue, um, uh, Orange uh, Cat uh, shows up to um, to if we could have a, a moment to talk about human and non-human species and our relationship to uh, non-human species. And, and, you know, right now we're at this time with, uh, you know, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, which is, uh, you know, it is a um, zoonotic uh, illness that has uh, come in part because of the expansion into, uh, into the, the, you know, from growing out of the, the uh, industrial food uh, and agriculture uh, into expanding into uh, into um, lands and territories, and uh, and we had and the, and and where the, the the coronavirus was passed from one species to to human species and non species non human species to human species, and we've um, we had just recently in June there was a, another a coronavirus that jumped from minks in, in uh, Denmark that jumped from in a mink uh, fur fur. Uh, and two humans, and there are 12 humans that have been, that have contracted a, another virus. And of course the minks in this uh, fur were, have all been uh, slaughtered. And, and, and I'm thinking so much about factory farms and, and, um, and the way that, uh, you know, linking of course to what you were speaking to Dr. Pomander about uh, indigenous sovereignty and accessing uh, food um, uh, and uh, traditional territories and also the relationship to industrialized agriculture and factory farms. And I'm thinking that we could very well see in, in very, re, in very, very soon uh, more coronavirus as we are looking at industrialized food, uh, factory farms, uh, the um, horrific conditions of, uh, of animals and factory farms and it's all industrialized. And I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Davis, I know that you've, um, you talk about uh, the relationship of uh, non-human species and and human species um, and, the, and and capitalism, and it seems so poignant right now, given that we are experiencing the, in terms of the global pandemic, the um, the effects of 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 um, this this folly, this human folly. Yeah, and. I I, I think it might be important to point out that uh, the very same logic uh, that creates racial hierarchies, uh, uh, hierarchies regarding um, who gets to be counted as human and who is not, uh, um, affect the ways we think about the non-human animals with whom we share this planet. Uh, uh, the complete uh, reification, <laughs> objectification of, of, of other animals as uh, 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 satisfying human need. Uh, and of course, uh, in, in the way industrial um, capitalist food production unfolds today, uh, uh, much of that uh, food, while it pretends to satisfy human need, is the source of disease. Uh, and 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 a range of problems, uh, so that um, yeah, the future um, future of um, social movements and political movements against capitalism has to involve uh, um, a, an engagement with the ways in which industrial capitalist uh, production of food is this are destroying, are destroying the planet. Uh, um, you know, for example, uh, the production of cattle and the ways in which that uh, is, is um, producing uh, the gases that are uh, polluting the, the, the atmosphere. Uh, yeah. Um, um, you know, there's, there's oftentimes a reluctance to talk about uh, decisions regarding how one eats. Uh, and, you know, I, I've been a vegan for a long time. Uh, and, and it is, um, it's, 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 it's about being conscious of how one participates um, in the 
reproduction of the global capitalist system in the in the way uh, one lives and the way one one eats and you know I think that this is going to have to become a major issue uh, um, and and certainly the 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 campaigns the recent campaigns you know standing rock uh, for uh, water uh, uh, for air, you know, for the earth uh, that have been led by indigenous people uh, should be instructive to people all over, you know, all over the world. And since uh, I, I think we're almost done with the conversation, I, I really want to emphasize an internationalist perspective uh, uh, that goes beyond uh, um, Turtle Island and this part of the world. Uh, uh, that what happens to us has an impact on, you know, what happens to uh, 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 Kurdish people uh, and what happens to people in Brazil. And we've already talked about the Philippines. I think it's so important to encourage that kind of a, a, a notion of citizenship, of global citizenship, of belongingness. Uh, and that relates very much uh, to uh, the ways in which the earth has been colonized by corporations like Monsanto, uh, who uh, are dis literally destroying the planet for the purposes of profit. Thank you, and I uh, to, I want to check with you, uh, Dr. Palmer, about the you know we about the obviously about the fish fishing, and but also about land back. If we could think about some of the ways in which we want to redress harms and move toward more caring economies, if you will. And, and when I say economies, I'm not talking about in terms of a capital sense, I'm talking about in capitalist sense, I'm talking about it in, you know, in terms of the, the kinship relationships. Um, yeah, no, I think it's really important because there's a lot of talk post COVID about the economic recovery and how we go forward and, you know, maybe modify some systems here and there and some additional programs and services. And it's like, how can you, how can you even think about a so-called just economy on stolen lands in, in a territory where the indigenous peoples are incarcerated and sterilized and their children are stolen and they're many of them suffer food insecurity. I mean, literally having ill health from not enough to eat, no, no clean drinking water or sanitation. I mean, that, and all of these systems are the layer on top of us, which weighs like a very heavy blanket. So, you know, everybody's preoccupied with the election, you know, when it's conservative to liberal here in Canada or what's happening in the States. And it's like, but you're forgetting this very, very first layer and how even the food system that, you know, Dr. Davis was talking about, that's very much manufactured and it's not even necessary. So think about what they do to Mi'kmaq people. We're criminalized, we're not allowed to fish or we will we'll be incarcerated, fined, charged and so on and so forth. So now our traditional way of eating, you know, oysters and clams and salmon and lobster, the way we always did, we can't do that anymore. So how do we have to eat? Well, we have to go and get a welfare check and find enough money. Well, and there won't be enough money. So you have to go to the local store and someone will make money off of us buying craft dinner or hot dogs or something that's been manufactured and produced a thousand times and relies on this huge system of genetically modified food, which makes us all sick. When in fact, what you could have done <laughs> was just be human and you know sustainable say sustainability for humans is directly tied to sustainability for fish and plants and wildlife and ecosystems and all of this manufacturing is only for the purpose of wealth this massive food production system like ma imagine genetically modifying food and forcing us to eat that especially native americans in the u.s who could be fined if they use heritage seeds. I mean, just the fact that you would call them a heritage seed, which is, it's healthier, it's more natural, the way it's grown is better. All of the ways in which we can engage naturally with food, what we can engage sustainably, we can find collective ways of doing it. Um, all of that is thrown out the window and criminalized in fact, 
and heavily regulated in favor of massive corporations making lots of money and then feeding the job and economic system and all of the other players in place. And that's literally playing out in Mi'kma'ki right now. Literally, it you, you could put that entire analysis on Mi'kmaq people who are of all the First Nations who are very historically impoverished in this country. In Mi'kmaq territory, we have some of the worst, but we live in some of the richest territories with the healthiest food. But when you're criminalized for doing it, you know, what are your options? The options are, We'll die. We have a much shorter lifespan than anybody else, and we'll be unhealthy for our lifespan because we're forced to rely on this capitalist food production, which isn't making anybody healthy, and it's hurting the planet when it doesn't have to be that way. It's not like we're doing this out of desperation. None of this has to be that way, and it's playing out in Mi'kma'ki, but not just in Mi'kma'ki. It's playing out everywhere else. Look at any of the remote communities, uh, some of the Cree communities, you know, forced to live on these tiny, small, remote reservations, not allowed to hunt and fish or sustain for themselves. But the only local store, those northern stores, you would have to pay 50 bucks for one thing of orange juice that was manufactured in the United States and all of the vitamins and minerals taken out of it. And that's what you're supposed to live on, essentially pure sugar, when it would have been so much easier for them to live as they had lived and been more sustainable. So none of it has to be this way. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't. And I, uh, Erica, can you see a path uh, out of capitalism? Can you see uh, an evolution beyond capitalism? Well, it would have to start with recognizing labor as humans and separating it from the production uh, cycle in, in an additive way or you can't get around from that. It, it starts and ends and it starts with labor and how we look at labor and how we look at it in terms of its value and how that needs to be created through um, a stronger sense of humanity and community rather than pitting it against capital. And so without that, we are just going to go through this cycle of, well, we'll have unions that will give more, it will just continue to be this power struggle. And the loss of power of that labor it, and the rise of, of neoclassical economics, which has led to this neoliberalism is not by accident. It has been pushed by, um, <laughs> by economists <laughs> for honestly for a few generations and economics itself oh there we go <laughs> um economics itself is another sort of um it's it's a profession that is very exploitative in a very gendered and racialized way itself so, you know, the, it's the blind leading the blind or, you know, and those who have benefited from all of these policies, it's not surprising that we have the largest income inequality since I think the 19, was it the 1880s, the Gilded Era, uh, when you had, you know, uh, Standard Oil and all of those people, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the, the Gettys, for example, uh, in that era. So it's, it's, it's not surprising that we're here, but literally it starts with the uh, removal of the human from labor, from exploitation. And mm -hmm. uh, before that's done, we have nothing. And all of this is contingent on the planet, isn't it, Harsha? I mean, we are noticing considerable uh, regression in uh, life, sustaining life as we know it on, on the planet. And I mean, I just saw some uh, news article the other day that talked about the Arctic ices and, and melting and, and how that's going to, it's, you know, we're in this kind of, we're on verging on this cycle of where uh, as the climate uh, crisis continues, it'll feed enhanced and accelerate the climate crisis. Uh, can you see a path uh, toward evolving beyond capitalism? 
Just that small question. <laughs> just a little one, just, just little like that. Um, I mean, it's necessary, right? And I think that is, um, I think that's that would be my answer to that. It's necessary. And that path is something that we absolutely have to be on and committed to. Um, there's no kind of uh, illusion, I think, that it will be easy. The reality is, is that we are, of course, enmeshed in capital relations. Um, we are also, um, you know, as Dr. Davis pointed out, we're all also complicit within various forms of capitalist production and rely on it, you know, this format and, and so much more, our clothes and, you know, to varying degrees, um, and particularly those of us who are in this part of the world. Um, if we were to think about it from an internationalist perspective, right? My clothes are likely produced in a sweatshop somewhere halfway across the world that I have no connection to someone who made that. Um, same with food, same with clothing, all of our basic necessities, all of the minerals that are being mined to produce our technologies. So um, I think we have to be honest about um, those kinds of sacrifices, right? But that those sacrifices uh, are are worth it because it it is those kinships it is those relational those relations those kinships that sense of community that sense of sustainability which is what we are all seeking and missing under capitalism already right we know that this is a deeply alienating isolating way to live uh, for some more than others of course um and so i think we have to be willing to see uh, the beauty in that. Um, and again, you know, some so many communities are already uh, thriving outside of capitalism, right? Like we're all bound up in capitalism. But uh, as Rihanna mentioned us, it hasn't touched all lands in the same way. And many communities continue to resist the imposition uh, of capitalism. So I, I do think it's necessary. And I think uh, a big piece of that is, you know, very similar to the reasons for why we need to reject uh, you know, reforms, um, particularly those reforms that are reformist reforms, as we know, there are, you know, reforms that, uh, that increase the possibility of freedom, and there are reforms that impede the possibility of freedom. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, very concrete kind of reforms, but in just to say in the environmental movement, um, the dominant environmental movement has largely sought solutions that entrench capitalist relations, you know, so capitalist greenwashing, uh, things like, you know, of course, recycling is so important, but it's a very individualistic neoliberal response. Um, and it makes us feel good without fundamentally altering the capitalist relations or colonial relations. And so, uh, you know, absolutely, one of the main ways in which uh, we need to be showing up uh, to support environmental movements is to support indigenous movements and to not support indigenous movements because they're environmental movements, but to support indigenous movements because that is the right and the ethical responsibility of non-indigenous people to support indigenous movements on their own terms, right? Not because of some kind of narrative that indigenous people will save us from the climate crisis. Uh, that's not a burden that anyone should have to bear, uh, but because it's our responsibility, or I should say, you know, responsibility of folks like myself. Um, and, you know, I think we also have a lot to learn from, you know, the food crisis of 2008, when the food crisis of 2008 hit, there was a lot of hope that that might be the, there might be a possibility of us re envisioning our food systems. And that didn't quite materialize. Instead, what we saw was agribusinesses going out around the world, particularly in Latin America and in Africa and green grabbing and grab and land grabbing. And today, agribusinesses are subsidized at the rate of $1 million per minute. $1 million per minute go to agribusinesses. Um, and many of them, you know, of course, implicated in the industrial food production um, and so much more that we talked about. And so I think the, so in this COVID moment and uh, this moment of climate crisis, I know every time there's a crisis, there's the, there's the possibility of hope. And, you know, here thinking of Mariam Kaba, where hope is a discipline, it's not easy to be hopeful, but it's a discipline. Uh, it's something, it's a muscle that we have to exercise. Um, and I think it's a necessity. And so the pathway out of capitalism is not one that'll be easy, but I think it's forged through struggle and it's forged through necessity and it's a forged through practice um, and recognizing the many ways in which uh, that practice is alive all around these worlds, that people are fighting back because existence is resistance, right? Existence is resistance for so many communities and frontline communities. So I think that's where the hope is. And then it's our responsibility to um, 
to grow those, to grow those possibilities, to believe in those possibilities, to, to nurture them. Um, because also it's, it's very hard. It's very hard to nurture something that we may not be used to, right? It'll take time. It'll take struggle. It'll take, it'll take generative uh, conversation and conflict. But I, I just turn to and return to the fact that it's a necessity. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Pometer, the, um, you know, so, uh, the, the, uh, the, you know, contact with, um, with U European uh, discoverers uh, and the process brought these, uh, the, the, another worldview and, the, and a worldview that has been proven to be incompatible uh, to indigenous worldview. And, and can you see us evolving beyond cap capitalism and in light of uh, the worldview that capitalism uh, holds, capitalist ideas holds? I, I think it's entirely possible. I mean, who would have thought 20 years ago that I had the power within my means to free Aboriginal people from prisons in Australia? But for our connections with people like Debbie Kilroy and her initiative of Free Her, I can take money I make from an honorarium for speaking, send it to them, and literally in real time, women and moms march out of prison and go back home to their families. So we, we cannot just change everything. We have the power to. It's about showing the rest of the world that we have the power to. That, you know, we've, we've been... We've been taught for so long that democracy means there's a couple of people that you vote for in office and then you sit back and then they make a whole bunch of decisions and then you do it all over again in four years, forgetting that in every society ever, it's always been the people who are the governments, the people who have the power. And, you know, these, these you know, racist white supremacist systems have worked very hard and very effectively at teaching that out of us, at making us think that, you know, it's not polite to exercise your voice. It's not proper to question a teacher. There's only certain things you should read and only certain things you should do. And you need to follow what everyone else is doing to be a good citizen. And good citizens don't make waves. But in fact, the very best citizens in the world are the ones who disrupt, are the ones who engage in social conflict and ideological conflict, because we know every time they do, there's been some kind of advancement or progress or rights that have been protected. And that is hopeful. The fact that we're in social conflict right now, multiple sustained periods of protests and resistance, that is hope because people are taking back their power. They're questioning all of this power that they've allowed these, you know, few people to hold for so long. And, and they're starting to see through the facade. And I think the more we can educate, the more we can empower, and the more we can show the path to action, that you can just not just learn about over incarceration of Indigenous peoples in Australia, but here's how you take action to do something about it, even if you're not an Australian, because what they do there impacts what happens here. And it's the same for the environment. If we can protect the Mackenzie River Valley Basin, that determines in large part the temperature of the Arctic Ocean, and that determines what happens around the world. And so long as people understand that they can make a difference, even as individuals, I think that's gonna change everything. <laughs> That's inspiring. Uh, that's fire. I'm getting texts and through. So that's fire. I'm getting all the fire signs. Uh, Dr. Davis, uh, this is where you live, isn't it? In uh, radical hope and in uh, and you know, freedom is a, a constant struggle. Well, you know, yes, uh, hope is necessary. I agree with everyone. Uh, you know, you know, Harsha, Evo, Mariam, Kaba. Hope, you know, hope. Hope is given to us, as Walter Benjamin said, for the sake of those who are otherwise hopeless. And the question about capitalism is a critical question. And I don't think it's a question about whether we believe that it's possible to move beyond capitalism. If we don't, this will be the end of our planet. It's an absolute necessity 
uh, not only to imagine a world beyond capitalism, but begin, but to begin to um, produce that world now in our movements, uh, in our lives, in our uh, conceptualizations. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think that we're most effective when we think in large, capacious terms, uh, even though we're involved in very specific uh, campaigns and very specific um, activities. Uh, so that, you know, what we're, if we're involved in the, in the, in the anti-violence movement uh, and we're interested, we're interested in beginning to minimize uh, um, a gender violence, we have to recognize that gender violence is the most pandemic form of violence in the world. And that it's very much connected to um, all of these other forms of violence, state violence. This is, you know, this is why um, organizations like Insight have been so important because they've thought us, uh, they've taught us, you know, how to um, conceptualize in ways that uh, um, demand that we see the world differently and that we begin that process now. If we see possibility of a world beyond capitalism, socialisms, communisms, whatever, uh, we have to begin to model that now. And we have to begin to um, try to produce the, the, the kinds of structures that will move us um, in, in that direction. Uh, and, um, and we need hope. And we also need to be excited about it. Uh, and we also need to know how to generate joy in the process of doing that work. Uh, uh, and you know, I think that's, um, that's where we are today. Um, and with that, uh, we can close. This is, uh, we have uh, inc you know, incredible, folks that are listening and watching on the live stream and, and uh, watching via Zoom. Uh, and I, I, want, I want you to, if you could join me please in thanking our incredible panelists in uh, sharing and breaking down the analysis around capital and democracy and, and, uh, and looking at the interconnections and the historical context in the present day. It has been an absolute pleasure to dream with you all and to uh, to imagine uh, a world uh, and also to, to see the path forward, which is about uh, building our hope and building the structures, continuing to build the structures and, and leveraging, really moving into this moment uh, of, uh, of possibility uh, because it is, uh, our lives depend on it as if they always did. They always did depend on it. And we are in a time right now where there's an increasing uh, consciousness of that and also capacity to move in that way. So the movements will continue. And I, I uh, thank you, Erica Eiffel, for sharing your, your wisdom and brilliance and Harsha Walia for uh, your fierce uh, warrior-ness and uh, Pam Pometer for laying it plain, just making it plain uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, and supporting all of this activism around the world. And of course, Dr. Angela Davis, thank you for your wisdom and brilliance uh, and for your leadership and for helping to shape a path of radical hope and radical consciousness. Uh, I would uh, like to say farewell for now. And until we see each other again, thank you everyone for joining today. Farewell.